You know, it's interesting to uh, to um, hear that yesterday we had um, there was all over the news that um, that Congress now has passed this uh, the Freedom to Travel to Cuba Act, in which uh, now there is going to be uh, some more leniency in regards of the embargo and uh, the amount of traveling uh, that can be done now in regards to the families going back and seeing their families or U.S. citizens, uh, for Cuban citizens. Uh, Cuban U.S. citizens will be able to travel now, how much medication, some of the uh, items listed that uh, uh, were, uh, are, or were in the embargo or still are, but those are things that now they're going to be receiving. Education, uh, you know, it's amazing to see how how Cuba is using education to, re to reduce this violence. You know, people are busy doing things. And in some cases, in the majority of cases, uh, you know, they get paid to be educated. Isn't that amazing? You know, we're here, we had to hustle. And, you know, uh, this morning I was hearing on the news, you know, the debt and the uh, uh, interest rates of how of many students now and how much interest rate they're paying from what cost eighty thousand now is costing them a hundred and twenty thousand and going and going up. So uh, people are in debt from the get go. So uh, it's it's a different model that maybe one day we'll be able to follow here in the United States. Um, Julie Petit, uh, you know the information that we receive. Uh, uh, through the media and other sources uh, is basically the conflict of Israel and, and Palestine. And we do not hear about what's going on with the youth in Palestine, what their struggles and how has this war uh, has impacted and, and is impacting them. So can you uh, tell us about the youth in Palestine? I'll try. Um. <laughs> Today is one that looks at the issue of space because when we talk about Palestine, Israel, you know, space is, is a critical, critical feature. And I'm going to talk about the issue of mobility. Whereas most youth don't think of mobility as an issue for Palestinians, it's an issue. It's a problem. And I'm going to talk about confinement and violence. And Palestinian youth, whether they're in the refugee camps or they're in Gaza, which has its camps as well, or the West Bank, they are among the most marginalized and at-risk youth in the Middle East. They're increasingly facing issues related to food insecurity, health care, and of course the perpetual violence inflicted on themselves, their communities, their families in the form of military assaults, house demolitions, uh, torture, arrest, and increasingly the physical obstacles that have been set up in the West Bank and Gaza that prevent their mobility. Um, and that's why confinement and mobility have become increasingly um, issues of concern because their access to education, employment, health care, and even their families are being um, obstructed through the wall and a series of checkpoints. And you know, if I had to sort of encapsulate what unites Palestinian youth, whether they're in refugee camps in Lebanon or they're in the West Bank or Gaza, is their vulnerability. These are people and youth without any protection, um, sort of at the mercy of military forces much stronger than they are. And what we see with Palestinians um, are new forms of segregation, spatial forms of segregation, not just refugee camps, but also what I'll call these enclaves in the West Bank that have been carved out by the wall and by checkpoints which then prevent people from moving. Now, two decades ago, Palestinian youth sort of emerged on the global youth scene in, during the Intifada, the uprising in the West Bank. And the images flowed to the West of Palestinian youth throwing stones um, at Israeli defense forces uh, to protest against the occupation. This was the, the generation, they're called the generation of the Intifada or the generation of the children of the stones. And this was a generation that was hopeful. They thought uh, peace could be achieved. And um, if you look at the new generation of Palestinian youth, they're just trying to survive. Uh, it's a very, very dismal, depressing situation. Um, people, there is a sense of hopelessness. 
No. And I, I like to use in my own research the, the um, concept of generations because it's an indigenous concept. Palestinians use the notion of generations to describe groups of people. You know, there's the generation of um, the Intifada, the Oslo uh, generation, and now there's just the generation of, of hopelessness. In Lebanon, they use the idea of generations of the Nakba or the catastrophe of 48, um, the generation of the revolution, the generation of the war, and now they call themselves, or they're referred to, unfortunately, as the generation of the argili, which is the water pipe, or the generation of the drum, the little derbeki, which uh, indicates youth just sitting idle, smoking and uh, playing the drum. And this is, these are powerful terms because they capture a generation's historical location the kinds of violence they've been um, subjected to that they themselves have participated in as well. This concept um, marks time, it captures era, it registers violence, and it very much registers identity, youth identity. Now, um, I think part of the conference was also to talk a little bit about urban, so I'll just say um, a few words about urban urbanization and Palestinians. You know, urban is not a natural category. It is constructed through political interventions. And in the case of the two urban centers that are um, prominent for Palestinians, one is Jerusalem and the other is Beirut, you know, because here I'm talking about the refugee camps in Lebanon also. And there is a policy of exclusion of youth from urban centers. Uh, in Jerusalem, the state actively works to prevent Palestinian access to Jerusalem. You cannot go into the city if you are from the West Bank. Um, you must have a permit, and um, it's basically uh, focused on youth, particularly males, between the ages of 14 and, and 50. You know, it, it varies. And in Beirut, with the reconstruction of the city center, Palestinian youth are simply marginalized economically. They cannot go to the new city center, which is a place of, for consumption and leisure. They're kept out by the kinds of violence they face when they leave the camps. So there are no global cities, you know, such as Cairo, Beirut, Amman, um, that are available to Palestinian youth. They're very much locked out, except, you know, the city of Ramallah, which is becoming sort of this new globalizing center uh, for Palestinian youth. Um, it's a city of tolerance, openness, diversity. It's the unofficial capital, if you will, of the Palestinian Authority. Now, getting back to this question of mobility, this has become the major issue in the daily life from hour to hour of Palestinian youth, particularly males. And you know, human rights are increasingly rights of mobility, social and geographic mobility. Uh, mobility is very much on the radar screen of social theory. We know that power operates through space and spatial practices determining who has access to space, who controls it, and who's denied access. So for Palestinian youth these days, their mobility is exceedingly limited. I mean, down to these very narrow confines. You know, I've talked to young people in camps who haven't left the space of a camp, a square kilometer in five and six years, or they have not left their villages in years in the West Bank. They cannot get out and move. They face violence on the outside and um, simply inaccessibility because they're cut off from the job market. So in looking at these two sites, refugee camps in Lebanon, where the bulk of the 400,000 Palestinian refugees in Lebanon live, um, and the West Bank, I'm going to look at what I call enclaves. Um, the, the enclave is a new spatial device of control that has emerged very recently in the ocu occupied West Bank. And how do you forge an enclave, a place where people are locked in? Well, you do it by erecting a wall, and you do it by putting up 500 checkpoints. On any one day, there are 500 or more checkpoints in the West Bank. You cannot go anywhere without going through a checkpoint even from one village to another. Um, and the enclaves, what they do is they lock Palestinians in and control their access to the outside. Now these aren't your you know, gated communities, your, your fortified cities. They're fortified not from the interior, they're fortified 
from the exterior. They're not to protect those inside. They're to protect settlers, Israeli settlers, in the West Bank from having to encounter the native. The settlers themselves also live in fortified enclaves or settlements, um, but they are armed. They have free passage in the West Bank. There's a series of bypass ro roads that um, only Israelis are allowed to use, and so they don't have to encounter or see the native. Um, Palestinians call these enclaves, and they particularly call Gaza, open-air prisons. Um, this is how they describe the effect of living in these, these enclaves. You're not really in prison, but you can't go out. Now, in short, in the West Bank and Gaza, one group is locked in, Gazans and, and West Bankers or Palestinians, and the other group, the Israelis, are allotted the freedom to settle and to come and go at will and not um, encounter natives. Now, this is done under the rhetoric of securitization. And um, securitization is like criminalization, in a sense, a rhetoric, rhetoric of criminalization that's used to justify building gated communities, uh, fortified you know, condominiums, this kind of thing, that keep people out and protect people on the inside. So the security discourse is used to justify confinement of Palestinians, particularly the young Palestinian male you know, explosive body um, that is used to uh, sow fear uh, and justify violence against uh, young people. Now, securitization is a powerful discourse, one that we're all familiar with in the post-9-11 world. And um, it's been argued by uh, certain scholars, you know, securitization, it's a black hole in which things collapse and disappear. It's a kind of catch-all category um, it's very magical. It can absorb any and all content. You can make it mean whatever you want it to mean. And this kind of rhetoric, this narrative of securitization and danger, you know, it's productive. It works in tandem with political interventions to um, confine Palestinians, control them, and justify um, the denial of their human rights. Now, Again, getting back to the, these enclaves, Jeff Halpern is an Israeli anthropologist who captured what is going on in the West Bank in Gaza. He calls it the matrix of control. And he said, in the matrix of control, you don't win by defeating or decimating your enemies, but, but by immobilizing them. And the matrix consists of the spatial and the legal bureaucratic. That is the wall and checkpoints on one hand and the permit system on the other because Palestinians cannot move from one place to another without a permit. So you've got you know, the spatial, the checkpoints, the blockades of villages and towns. You have trenches and gates and, and roadblocks and bypass roads and tunnels, tunnels that go under uh, bypass roads so Israelis do not have to encounter or see Palestinians. And then you have the permit system. This is the matrix of control, and it operates under the larger guise of closure. You know, we talk about the West Bank and Gaza being under strict closure, meaning people cannot move, people, goods, and goods cannot move um, between the West Bank and Gaza, between the West Bank and Jerusalem, and of course, within the West Bank. Closure doesn't just uh, separate Palestinians from each other, uh, sorry, from Israelis, it separates them from each other. Now, at checkpoints, and these, are, these can range from small, you know, two soldier checkpoints to large terminals that now resemble international borders where one has to um, show one's documents, queue up and go through metal turnstiles. Um, they, some of them are large, large enough that they resemble checkpoints or border passages between states. And when Palestinians go through these, in a sense, they are compelled to order. Their bodies are surveyed process and validated, and it's determined whether they can move from one place to another. And the main uh, target, of course, are young males, young females as well, but checkpoints are gendered as well as aged, and um, the male between the ages of 13 and 40 is the, uh, the main target. And um, 
you see the, the Palestinian male appears more and more confined, lacking mobility, always under surveillance, needing permission to move. And this is very much in contrast to the very youthful, hypermasculine Israeli Defense Forces personnel that are controlling their movement. Um, and this is very much a spectacle. I think of checkpoints as spectacles where Palestinian uh, subjugation is performed on a daily basis. And it's clear for all to see. Now, in spite of this uh, immobility, uh, this confinement of, of youth, we have the internet. And you know, some of the speakers have spoken about this, this sort of global culture that's emerging. And we do see Palestinian hip hop um, coming out. And you know, people talk about this generation of Palestinians as being somewhat depoliticized, lacking you know, in a strong political and national identity. And I think if you look at Palestinian hip hop, you see this a form of protest and affirmation of identity. Um, and youth still being mobilized politically, but in very different ways than they were, say, um, 20 years ago. Um, now, if I look at the, just to iterate very quickly, the major issues facing Palestinian youth, whether they're in refugee camps in Lebanon or in the West Bank and Gaza, and I think the primary issue is violence. There is a profound sense of vulnerability and insecurity. The constant exposure to violence, whether from settlers, soldiers, you know, from the, from the air, from those F-16s, the sense that violence is imminent. People live in a constant state of nervousness, a heightened state of alert. Um, from assaults, also detention, uh, torture, simply being um, brutalized by settlers and the security force. And there's a sense that there is no protection, that nobody's watching, because partly because the media is not watching. Um, the, you know, if the West Bank and Gaza are closed, they're closed to the media as well. I think we saw that with Gaza, that it was very difficult for the media to get in, but we saw uh, footage coming out. So there's, in a sense, for this generation, there's a real lack of hope, a real dismal sense of the future. The future, people talk about it in sort of black terms. It's a black, uh, it's a whole. Um, scholars and observers, crisis group, recently had a um, report on the camps in Lebanon, casting them as ticking time bombs because of this frustration and lack of hope for the future. Um, the lack of mobility works in tandem with what I call um, calibrated chaos. Checkpoints impose unpredictability. You can never know what you're going to do or accomplish in a day. Time has slowed down. And one of the most ubiquitous sites at the checkpoints are the young Palestinian male who's been detained, told to sit, and can sit there all day. You can see the same guy sitting there when you go in the checkpoint and you come out, um, silently squatting or standing up against the wall, waiting until he's told he can go or he's detained. Declining educational opportunities are another factor that pervade this generation's lives. They are this generation is less well educated than their parents, both in Lebanon, in the camps, and in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, closure is affecting people's ability to get to school. The dropout rate is increasing among high school youths. If you're poor, you simply cannot afford the, uh, the bus fees to take multiple buses to go to school because the checkpoint, you have to get out, walk across, get another bus or taxi. And this hits young girls even harder because parents fear to let them uh, go through checkpoints alone. They're out for long hours, often stuck at checkpoints. The checkpoints can close for no reason, and families are very hesitant to let young girls uh, go to school in this kind of situation. Um, youth are facing unemployment and the idleness that goes with it, and of course, extreme poverty. We know that poverty with closure in the West Bank and Gaza has increased threefold in the past five years. 70% of the population is living below the poverty line. Youth also face the prison experience. If you've worked with Palestinians under occupation, the number of males who've been through the prison system or been detained is phenomenal. Um, 
Maya Rosenfeld's research into Haitian camp in the West Bank found that 85% of families had sons who had been through the prison system. It's nearly impossible to find a young male who has not been um, detained or imprisoned. Now, youth uh, and gender, you know, gender identities are in sort of a crisis mode, particularly again for males. You know, the masculinity is severe, severely challenged when males cannot perform the tasks often associated with being young men. Um, they're confined, they cannot be breadwinners, it's difficult to get married because they don't have the money. Um, they're not able to protect their communities. Um, they lack mobility. All of these are challenges to masculinity. Some people are describing it as the feminization of the Palestinian male. They've been domesticated because they sit at home and cannot go out to work or protect their families. Um, I just, I know I have about one minute, and so I'll conclude by just saying a few words about youth responses, because I've given a very bleak picture. Um, you know, isolation has led to some creative responses. There's an emergence of very localized youth leadership in um, villages. What happens, uh, villages that are having their land confiscated and where the wall is coming through have become sites of weekly protests. And these protests bring youth from the International Solidarity Movement as well as progressive Israeli youth uh, who work against occupation and the wall. And this has given an opportunity to local youth to emerge as leaders, you know, distant from the sort of centralized bureaucracy of the Palestinian Authority. Um, you see youth being very involved in very creative media projects, hip hop as well as um, using uh, media to serve as witnesses to human rights violations um, under the occupation. I'll conclude by saying one thing about uh, violence here. And I've done quite a bit of research on the protests in the villages, which by and large start as very nonviolent, peaceful protests and are met with violence on the part of the um, occupying forces so that people who are marching and protesting peacefully are subjected to tear gas and rubber bullets and beatings. And what this does is it sends a message that nonviolence will not be tolerated, that um, nonviolence will be met with violence. And I think part of the reason why, of course, is to, of course, squash resistance, but also nonviolent Palestinian youth protesting occupation in peaceful ways, they don't conform to the media image of the irrational, violent Palestinian youth. Thank you.